my story started 15 years ago when I had my um, fourth child. Um, when he was born, he, um, something just didn't seem right to me. And I kept saying, you know, his, his cry is kind of different. And they said, well, he probably swallowed merconium. I said, okay. And then he, he turned blue a little bit. And so they put him in the critical care um, or special care nursery for a short amount of time. But we wound up bringing him home as normal. And we were, we were assured that he was just fine. Um, a few weeks into bringing him home, we brought him back and learned that he was not gaining weight. And the doctor diagnosed him with failure to thrive, but didn't give us a reason why. He said um, potentially that he had in uterine growth retardation, but that he would um, keep catch up eventually. Um, I wasn't feeling really confident. I, I just had this gut feeling about it that was, something wasn't right. And so I brought him to um, another pediatrician for a second opinion across town. That pediatrician told me that, yes, he did see some red flags and that I should probably see a genetic doctor and that he could get me in in three to four months, which was very unsettling to me, um, knowing that he wasn't growing. And so I went back home and um, it, it got worse as we were moving forward. He was crying all the time. He wasn't sleeping. Um, he still was not gaining weight. Um, I think at six weeks old, he was still at about eight pounds. It, it, was, it was getting to be really a problem. Um, and so I called my pediatrician, my original pediatrician, and I said, you know, he's not eating, he's not gaining weight, what are we gonna do? And he said, I think you really just need a lactation specialist. He's probably not latching on, and that's the problem. Well, I had um, three kids that I had nursed for a year, and I felt like I knew what I was doing at that level, and so I didn't pursue that avenue. Um, but about five weeks into the process, I kind of hit a wall. I was exhausted. Um, my three other kids were not getting all that they needed from me. Cooper was still crying, and he started to turn blue into purple um, each and every time that I fed him. And so I went in to um, see the pediatrician's colleague, and she said, I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to work with you and, and figure this out. So we went home, and the, and the next morning I actually got a call from her. She said, I have stayed up all night long researching this. I think I know what it could be. Um, could you come back to the office? And so I said, sure. We had some blood work drawn, and I am a researcher, and I, I ask questions constantly. For whatever reason, I didn't want any information that day. I just didn't, I didn't want to know what she had found on the internet. Um, but I went home, and um, she said it would take a few weeks to get the results back. And again, it just kept getting worse, and I was getting more and more frustrated. And so about a week into it, I called her crying, and I said, I, can't, I just can't do this anymore. It's too much. And could you please just put him in the hospital until you figure something out? And she said, absolutely. It's appropriate. There are enough things going on. Let's get him into the hospital. And I remember it was a Monday, um, kind of a perfect storm in that um, when we arrived at the hospital, I didn't know, but my, um, the test results had come back. And his um, original pediatrician returned home from vacation. And so he got the charge of um, coming to the hospital to see us. I was sitting in my um, hospital chair with Cooper in my lap and didn't know that he had um, come back from vacation. And the door opened and he walked in, he's about six foot four, and he walked in with another man of similar stature and didn't say hello, didn't sit down. He basically just spit out, it's the worst thing you could have imagined. He has Cree du Chat syndrome. He's missing part of his fifth chromosome. He will probably never eat or walk or talk, or learn. We are gonna um, put a feeding tube in him to give him the best chance. We're gonna run some tests on his organs over the next few days. 
and I'll be back to answer any questions you have tomorrow. And he turned and he left. And my mom um, raced out after him. I, I, I know she had a few words with him. Um, he had been my pediatrician for eight years. I loved this pediatrician. I trusted him. He had taken care of my three older kids. Um, but my nurse, the nurse of the day came in and, and said, are you okay? And I said, I'm just, I'm not. And she said, is there anything I can do? And I said, yeah, don't let that man back in my room. I don't want to see him again. And she said, but you have to have a doctor. And I said, I know that and I'll figure it out, but not right now. The next morning when I woke up, um, the pediatrician who had stayed up all night long showed up in our room. And she said, I just heard his diagnosis and I just ran over to give you a hug and to see if there's anything I can do to support you as you move forward. And I said, yeah, you could be his pediatrician to begin with. And at that moment, um, she gave me her home phone, her working direct line, her cell phone, her cabin phone. And with that, my anxiety just calmed. I felt like I could do it because I had someone on my side that was going to support me and walk through this ordeal with me. Um, so we did have um, his feeding tube put in and um, we brought him home and we started the journey. I would um, nurse him a little bit to give his mouth um, some exercise and then I would pump and then I would tube feed him and then I would teach my kids some um, lessons for school and then we'd do it all over again. I want to tell you um, the end of this story before I keep moving forward. So when you partner with patients and families, you might have a, a different outcome. Mine didn't come for about 13 years. Um, last year, when Cooper um, got really sick, I called the clinic to make an appointment. I don't like to bring him to the emergency room because with his syndrome, it can be really complicated to explain all of his intricacies. So they were gonna get me into a same day appointment. And um, the only pediatrician that was available that day was the pediatrician that I had basically fired in the hospital. And I didn't hold any will, ill will. I, I didn't have any bad feelings towards him. And so I said, okay. So we went in and um, Cooper had pneumonia and a double ear infection, but he walked in, the doctor walked in as if he, nothing had ever happened. And he said, hey, Coop, how are you? You're growing a mustache, you're getting so big. And, and in my head, I'm thinking, I wonder if he sees that he walked in here and that he's talking. And so we sit down. Um, at the desk and we're facing each other and he's going to write a prescription for an antibiotic and I said to him I looked him in the eye and I said do you remember that day in the hospital and he immediately put his head down on the desk and when he sat back up he was crying and he said I am so sorry I had never had to tell a family member that kind of news I didn't know anything about that syndrome. I just wanted to give you that information and get out of there. And nobody teaches you how to do that in school. And um, I can tell you that that day was really healing for me. It made a big impact on me. But the biggest impact was how much it impacted him, that he had been carrying that um, situation with him um, for the last 13 years and cried on a dime when I asked him about it. So that taught me um, a lot as I was moving through this journey. Um, I, I've told this story a few times and I always leave out that ending and everybody says, but you didn't tell that ending. So that's why I've kind of flipped these um, slides around. As you can see, this is Cooper. He is walking his dog and as um, Teenage boys love, he is surrounded by girls, so his outcome is really um, a, a good one. And um, it was, and we still see that original pediatrician um, to this day when we need to. So here's my final story, and I'll make it quick. Um, this is my daughter, Emily, the one who stomped her feet and is now 18 years old. 
Um, about two years ago, she woke up in the morning and had 106 temp. Brought her into the urgent care and she just laid out on the floor and fell asleep. And I, I know it's hard for um, providers to know this, but I just, I wasn't someone that took my kids to the doctor really quickly. I knew she needed to be seen. And the doctor said, it's just a virus. You need to wait it out. And I said, I don't know. Can you take um, some blood and just check the bacteria levels? And, and so she did that and, and they were off, but she said, it's too early to know anything. You need to just go home and ride it out. So I brought her home and remember that pediatrician that gave me her four phone numbers? It's the first time I ever used it. And I said, this is the situation um, and I'm concerned. Thankfully, I had been working at the hospital association and knew some things to look for. And I said to her, I think she might have sepsis. And she said, yeah, I think you're right. Can you just get her there really quickly and tell them that? So we did, um, got to the hospital and um, they, they hooked her up to everything and started doing testing. And um, it's an odd age at 18 because they don't really want parents' involvement. So they kept saying, can we just see her alone? And, um, but she was incoherent. She didn't really know with 106 temp exactly what she was saying. Um, we spent nine hours in the emergency room and they did think that she had a kidney infection. Um, but they kept coming in saying, but she looks really good. And she did. She always had a smile on her face when they walked in. Um, but I said, this isn't her. Something's really wrong. And um, she'd give a pain score. She was crying and throwing up and headache. And, and they'd say, what's your pain rate? Zero to 10. And she'd say, oh, three. And I'd look at her like, three? And um, they said, well, she said three. So this, uh, this resident came in and after nine hours and he said, you know, the doctors all think she looks really good and probably you should go home. But I'm hearing that you're concerned. I'm, I, I, I wanna respect that. So whatever you wanna do, I'll go to bat for. Um, I'll go talk to the senior doctors and, and see what I can do if you want her admitted. And so I chose to go home and we spent a horrible night with her throwing up. Um, her temp kept going up. We went back in the morning. Um, the same resident was there. He readily admitted us, or no, we brought us into the ER. We spent another nine hours in the ER and the same thing. We think she looks pretty good. We don't know what's going on. Um, so we think you could go home, but we're willing to admit her. And so I said, I'm, this time I'm gonna admit her. Um, thankfully I did. Um, she went down very quickly. She was in the ICU for a week with sepsis um, that turned into respiratory, acute respiratory distress syndrome um, where everything was filling with fluid and um, it, it seemed to be hit or miss for a short amount of time. Um, I was thankful for the times that the doctors asked for my opinion. Um, to say what is normal for her, what isn't normal. Um, we had another instance in where they did a bedside rounding. Um, I wouldn't have known that at, unless I had been at the hospital association, but the nurses came in and one nurse said to the other, yep, she's in for pneumonia. And I said, whoa, I didn't know that she ever had pneumonia. And she said, well, yeah, she, she's in for pneumonia. And they checked and they were checking for pneumonia. They were doing some lab work and things like that, but no, she didn't have pneumonia. So um, my, my learning from this is that that shared decision-making is really important and having a patient's family be part of the process when they are not coherent and um, not able to maybe give you the full picture is important. The outcome, when you partner with patients and families, this man right here is the resident that worked so, um, so closely with me those eight, over those 18 hours. I, I called the hospital later to say what a great job he had done and how important it was for me to be heard and to li be listened to. So I had invited him to speak at an, a, 
a asso hospital association event about including the patient. And what I found out that day was that when we were admitted, it was his third day ever of residency. And so I was just even more excited about him because I thought it took a lot of courage for him to really um, say that he would talk to the doctors and things like that. So Emily, like she actually um, got a sticker for her car that said, um, go to this hospital, they saved my life. And she credits him because she thinks that, that that's what saved her life. It's just because he listened to me when she didn't know what to say. So Twal <coughs> Gawandi um, says, outsiders tend to be the first to recognize the inadequacies of our so social institution. But precisely because they are outsiders, they are usually in a poor position to fix them. I put this in there because um, I was one of the fortunate ones that got invited in. I spent a lot of years being really frustrated about the things that went wrong in 15 years ago and not being able to do a thing about it. And um, so about eight years ago, the Minnesota Alliance for Patient Safety invited me to share my story. And that was my first step into a really scary system. Because for, for a patient, hospitals and healthcare are intimidating, um, scary, very unknown. We, we don't really know what to expect. And so it was, it was exciting for me to be able to share my story. I wouldn't get up in front of the audience. I was scared to death. So they showed a video and asked me to just answer questions. And I said, okay, but like three because I don't do this. Um, from that, I was invited to um, be part of the um, MAPS board, Minnesota Alliance for Patient Safety Board. And then later on, the Minnesota Hospital Association asked me to be part of their first patient and family advisory council. Um, they knew that CMS was going to require this of hospitals, patient and family engagement. And so they wanted to kind of set a model for the state on, on what it looks like and how it could be done. So I was one of those fortunate ones that got to really be involved in the system and, and to give my input. And so um, I, the other part of this that is impactful to me is that we also, as outsiders, don't know what it's like in your world. And so in the last three years, I have learned so much about um, what it's like to be in, well, not in your shoes, but be part of the system. I didn't realize the regulations that you had to endure, the criteria that were set, the HCAP scores. I mean, the list just keeps going. Every time I, I go to, into the office, it seems like there's something new that they're measuring or looking at or trying to determine. And so being able to be part of this has helped me learn the other side of the coin, which has been, it, it really has impacted me positively. So um, because of that confusion at the beginning with all those terms, um, there is Minnesota Hospital Association created Include Always. And the mission statement for that is Include Always. That's what we aim to do. Include patients and families at every level throughout the healthcare system. Through conversations, sharing ideas, and inviting the patient in, the outcome will be better health care for everyone. We're not launching a campaign that begins and ends, but together we're creating a cultural <coughs> shift, a unified mindset where the patient is truly one of us. It's a whole new health care approach. It takes a whole lot of change, and it takes courage. It takes all of us working together to be our, make our system the best it can be. We will listen more, engage often, and include always. So it is really just about making the patient an expert at being a patient. And, and what does that feel like? What does that look like? And how, how, can it, how can we help the system in whatever way we can? Um, but my challenge um, that I want to leave is do one thing this week to actively and intentionally include a patient or family member in the system. Um, so like I said earlier, I was fortunate enough to be invited in to share kind of what my experiences and perspectives were, which has allowed me to learn more about the system and why things are done in a certain way. 
and um, has really helped in my process of healing, in my journey of healing through any of the stories that I've experienced. Um, but I also know that through all of my experiences, I always had that mindset that um, the people taking care of us, me and my family, only want to do good, right? And so they went into this to take care of people, to heal people, to do, do good for people. And um, what happens in a bad event is if they don't feel, if a patient feels like they're being excluded, they, they have an assumption that maybe there isn't good intent. And I think that sometimes when you partner with patients, they always will know then that the trust level is there. So when I go into different hospitals and um, work with the patient and family advisory councils, that's a lot of what I hear from the patient side is that their trust level goes up, they understand things more, they're more connected to the system.